Good morning, America. Today in um, sunny, well, not so sunny Binghamton, as I always tell you, um, this is New York. And when I moved here from Cali uh, Colorado, uh, my friends and family who lived here reminded me that New York is not Colorado. I'm not going to see the sun a lot. And sadly, that seems to be the case so far this spring. However, it's still wonderful to be here with family and be uh, surrounded by my grandkids. This is Yvonne DeVita. You're listening to Smart Women Conversations. And today we're going to go on a journey. And it's a fascinating journey. And it's a journey that I want you to hear about that my guest today is going to share with us. Sue Reed is the founder and owner of Sweet Fortune Cookies out of Rochester, New York. And guess what? That's where I grew up. So I can't <laughs> wait, Sue, to come to Rochester and meet you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so now, glad to be here today. I'm, I'm just like, this story that Sue has shared with me is, um, it's familiar and not familiar. It's, it's something that all of us have experienced in one way or another. And she is really passionate about how she shares it and what she has to tell us that I think is so valuable. So Sue, let's start the journey back with your grandmother. I'm really, you know, fascinated and, and thrilled about that because I love to hear about how we, we ladies look to our moms and our grandmoms. Uh, for the things that help us build who we are. Tell us about how your grandmother influenced you. So my grandmother lived in New York and there was just some love, a very strong love that I had for my grandmother and it was very mutual. And I would like to visit her. I would just go to New York and just spend some time with her alone just because I loved, it wasn't that we did anything. It was just that it was just very comforting and she was very loving and made me realize while we were sitting on a bench in Central Park, we would just talk that how important the elderly are yeah. in life and that yeah. they really shouldn't be pushed aside. They have so much to offer, but people really not giving them the opportunity to offer that. This is, you know, going back, you know, 40 years ago with the leader, Maggie Kuhn, the leader of the, of the Great Panthers. Um, so, I really learned a lot from my grandmother and realized that elderly have a lot to offer. So that was the beginning of my path. My One of my first paths was, was in gerontology. Yeah, and so education. Tell, us, tell us, wait, tell us who the Gray Panthers are. People might not know. Oh, well, there was this woman from 40 years ago who was, she was called the, the leader of the Gray Panthers, gray-haired people who she was an advocate for the elderly, basically, and she wanted rights for the elderly. Mm -hmm. As Susan B. Anthony wanted rights for women, like to vote. She mm -hmm. wanted the elderly not to be shunted aside. Mm -hmm. So that she had a very big impact on me. That, but also it, along with my grandmother, and I saw that my grandmother. I mean, she did like reading for the blind, but she, I think that she and all elderly, have, they have so much more potential. They just needed a way to have it developed. So one of the very first positions that I took was at uh, Glassboro State College in New Jersey. And we wrote several grants and we received funding for the elderly. And this was when they had the, the Federal Older Americans Act. And a lot of elderly, because of finances or they had to take care of their children, didn't have the time to educate themselves or didn't have the time to go to college because they were working and they were any money that they did have they would it would go towards their family so that we started this program at three state colleges in new jersey bringing elderly onto the campus you know older americans onto the campus oh my god i love that i love working with the elderly but it was all because of my they were so appreciative they were so excited you know, to be on a college campus because they heard about it from their children and their grandchildren, but they didn't know. They were like scared when they first got there. I'll never uh -huh. forget that. They were like a little worried. So, but it was a wonderful experience. It exposed them to education, campus, everything with their children and grandchildren. They saw where their money went. And, but they also became educated. 
and it was also their that interaction with, with the with the young people. Yeah. They didn't go to class with them, but they were on the campus like a summer school program. So that was amazing. And then, I mean, that grew into developing, you know, on campus that grew into developing uh, pre-retirement plannings for children of aging parents. Hmm. That went on to develop like a manual, that, uh, a a manual that we used with um, Exxon employees in that in the New Jersey area. So, I, and then yeah, so that then I be I was involved with this on a state level with this with. Uh, Oh my God, I'm just trying to think of the name of that nursing home. But we spent many years working together in coalition with children of aging parents, developing programs for children of aging parents, because the children had to take care of their children and they also had to take care of their elderly. So the, I, that's what we did. So, I, so that's what we did. Um, mm -hmm. So I worked with the, well, that's when the Federal Older Americans Act, and we worked with the New Jersey State Department of Aging. And so I would travel and meet with the state to talk about the programs that we were developing for the elderly. And I love that. I love doing that. So, um, and then after that, when my husband was in the, yeah, medical, no, he was doing an internship here at Strong. Oh. So we moved to, so we moved to Rochester and I get so sidetracked. And so anyway, we lived at Whipple Park, which was university. Anyway, so we moved here. And now my, I learned from my grandmother um, and from, from my mother, we developed this love for art. And I said, I think at this point, I feel like I need, you know, it's a whole new world right now, moving into ah, a different city. Right, and I said, right. well, now I can move. And I do like changes, but I like to stay without change. It seems to be, I look back, it's like every decade, it seems to be a change or every yeah. 12 years. So I go, okay, um, you know, I can do, and I did do some work here with the elderly, but I felt at that time, I needed something creative. I needed something expand a little bit more other than doing administrative and sitting, you know, working. Sure. I wanted something that was more creative. Sure. And I saw that, so I worked with the Aesthetic Education Institute and worked with you know, training teachers and going to the classroom with students, presenting art program, fine art lecture um, pro programs and projects that we did with the kids in the classroom. And then we did, you know, we worked with like Garth Fagan. He did like dance. We did, I did the arts with somebody else. Somebody else did reading. We all, it was a summer program. The Aesthetic, wow. it, it actually came out of the um, Lincoln Center in New York City. Um, they, that's where it was developed. So I did that for many years. Now, all of a sudden, there was a space at the Memorial Art Gallery, 500 square feet. Yep. And I want, I thought, my God, we have to introduce kids to art because that's what I've been doing, working with a, yes, I get to, working with kids in art. And they said, and they, no, we know, we, we ought to put all American art in this 500 square feet. I said, you don't need it, the Memorial Art Gallery. I said, we don't need any more art in here. We've got enough. We need to bring young fam. We need to bring families in here with their children and expose them to art. So we got a whole committee together and everybody gave input as to like, what should be in that room? Like how to look, what do you look at? I mean, we had Betsy Brayer who did like a whole painting. If somebody just, I mean, everybody who had a different, role in developing the child space. I mean, we had to make mirrors. I had one woman who worked with the optics department. I mean, it was amazing. And it was an incredible experience. And I've never heard of an exhibit being lasting for like 10 years. This lasted for 10 years. Awesome. And it was, oh, it was, um, I loved it. And then, oh, I, we developed a puzzle, jig art. We took one of the paintings that was a favorite for families. And I went to talk to a guy who could make jigsaw puzzles but it wasn't only it, had, it was a jigsaw puzzle you know but for grandparents to give to their grandchildren and do together but on the back of the pu wooden puzzle there were questions that the grandparents could ask the grandchildren like what do you see? so it was like this interactive puzzle that was just like a little piece of that and then um yeah, so that was a whole, so that was that. And then uh, at the age of 50, that's when I went through my divorce. And the world and, changed dramatically, and correct? And the whole world changed dramatically. I mean, those of us that have been through it, it doesn't matter if you were a stay-at-home mom. I mean, even then it was awful. 
but I mean, it just at that age, at that age, it's, it's really devastating. It, it's shocking. It's devastating. And there, the, the, you know, the wound was there and the wound will always be there. It just felt like somebody stabbed me in the heart, but that lasted, that lasted for, oh, I would say like a good 10 years because I loved Ron with my heart and soul. And I thought he loved me. I just had no idea. I was really distraught. I really, and I had my youngest daughter, Alexis at home, and she was only seven. And I, anyway, so I needed somebody to talk to. And I remembered as a child, um, how comforting nuns were. I guess now that I'm talking to you, it kind of reminded nuns. me. Nuns. Nuns, nuns. Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> yeah. So I said, you know, I, I need to talk to somebody who has had experience with people in life with all their different situations, whether it's divorce, alcoholism, fine, any of those topics. Yeah. Because I figured that they've dealt with all of this. So I remember, I, and I always passed the Sisters of St. Joseph's Mother House when I was taking my kids to school or their, you know, their piano lesson or whatever. Um, and I go, you know, someday, if I ever need help, I'm going to just drive into the Sisters of St. Joseph's Mother House. So I drove in the driveway and I like knocked on the door. I'd never been there before. And I go, I don't have an appointment or anything, but I really feel like I really need to talk to somebody. So Ann Alderman came to the door and said, I can talk to you, but can you come back in three hours? Oh. And I go, oh, I waited whatever, like all these, all the, you know, a year, I guess I can wait three hours. So I literally got in the car and I was so distraught. I, I mean, I couldn't even think I couldn't do. I would, like, remember driving around, couldn't wait for the three hours to come up. And I, so then I went back to her and, I, and she was phenomenal. She's the one who really helped me move in a, dire a positive direction where I wasn't so mourning because I just kept saying to Aunt, she was so, so wise. I mean, I kept saying to Anne, like, just tell me, why did Ron leave? I just, if I knew why, she said, Sue, no matter what reason he would give you, it would never satisfy your needs. So when I've had friends who were like dying of cancer, or they've had a trauma and they have asked me, they say like, why did this happen to me? I didn't do anything to deserve this. And I always go back to her answer because it's true. There is no answer that will satisfy your need. And that's the answer. Yeah. And I love that. And wow. so I, that has stayed, that stayed with me. And that gave me, I think, the strength to breathe like I'm doing right now mm -hmm. and like, to, and to try to move on. So um, I explored different things. I said, you know, I was thinking about a franchise. I was thinking about a wow. writing opportunity. Because you wanted to be your own boss, right? You wanted to I wanted to be my own business. boss. Huh? You wanted I'm to sorry? start a business? Yeah, or a friend of mine who I met at this golf program uh -huh. said to me, why don't you, why don't you, because he knew what I was thinking. I mean, I was very close to him and I could tell him like what was going on. He knew what mm -hmm. was going on. And I said like, I, you know, I've got to like start. I've got, I want to start. Those were the three things I was interested in. Either buy, you know, get, it, get into a franchise where there's already a template set up that you could just go into. Sure, and I actually, yeah. Go to a to a meeting about a franchise, but then I learned you really need in order to at least break even, you need to have like more than one franchise anyway, and have enough money and have a partner who you can work with, you uh -huh. know whether it's a, a you know a husband help, or a child me, yes. as a franchise because somebody's got to be the inside person and somebody's got to be the marketing outside person. So this friend said to me, "Why don't you start a, a fortune cookie business?" I said, like, "Fortune cookies? You mean like bake, like be a baker?" So now I, um, I thought about it and thought about it and I go, okay, you know, he, he said to me, you know, this is perfect for you because you have to wear all these different hats. You have to figure out how to make the cookie. You have to like to have somebody show you how to make the cookie. Then you have to make them. Then you have to market it. Then ease it. And that's perfect for you because you love to be like constantly busy and be, these are perfect for you because you're with other people. So I go, hmm, and then I go, okay, 
I'm going to go in that direction. So I interviewed, I said, so I showed a couple of people in Rochester, bakers, like what I was trying to do, but nobody got it. Because the first thing I had is a gigantic fortune cookie the size of a football. And nobody could really... Wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. You you made this or you it was a, a, a prototype? It, the, no, no. The first thing was just a concept. I wanted not a little cookie like the okay. Chinese fortune. I wanted a gigantic that made a statement that like, if you moved into a new home, ah. welcome to your new home. And people go, oh my God, look at this. I've never seen it, but it had to be delicious. It had to be delicious. Of course. I mean, I wasn't going to have food because I love really good food. So I talked to people in Rochester. Nobody could figure out what I wanted. Then I, I talked to a chef. A, it had to be a pastry chef, not a chef in Philadelphia. So I drive, and I will do whatever, whatever has to be done. I will do it. I will drive, I drive, anyway. So I drove to Philadelphia, met the guy there. And I don't know, and then I, so he, that didn't work out. Then I called some pastry chefs in New York City. I made, tried to make some connections. I met Jeannie. Jeannie was my link to the cookie. I wish she was here with me now. So Jeannie goes, so I said to Jeannie, this is the concept. This is what I want to make, a gigantic fortune cookie that I can sell online, market and sell online and put, you know, like a long message in there. It can be, you know, a, just a, a, mess, a personalized message. So she actually was the one who, made, who would make the cookie. I would come back to New York and we would, you know, look at it together and talk about it and the decoration. I go, okay, Jeannie, I'm ready to go. So I met, Jeannie was a pastry chef and she did, I think, I think she did some baking for like the White House. I mean, she was really good. Wow. So we need it now. And the next thing is we need a kitchen. I mean, you can't. So she said, at the New York Waterway Ferry Terminal, there's a ferry boat on the Hudson River. We can rent, we can rent the ferry because it's stationary. It's where people go in and buy their ticket to actually take the ferry oh, to go from okay. New Jersey to New York. It's like a ticket office, but it's a, it's a boat, it's a ferry. Wow. She said there are, I can't remember, it's a regular boat. So there wow. was a kitchen in there. So she said, Sue, we can meet at the New York, Arthur Imperator, Arthur Imperator started the New York Water, New York Waterway Ferry Terminal. It's quite something else. People thought it was gonna be a folly, like whatchamacallit's folly, what was that called? Seward. Anyway, huh? Seward's Folly. Yeah, Seward's Folly. Well, people thought this was good. People were not going to drive and park in the parking lot in New Jersey and then take a seven minute boat ride over into New York in winter. <laughs> but it blossomed and it grew. So now I, so I said to Jeannie, okay, I'll meet you on the boat. We set up a time every Wednesday. And I said, be at nine o'clock in the morning. But I said, Jeannie, it's got to be between nine and 10 because going through Lincoln Tunnel, I have no idea. It could be one minute yeah. or it could be one hour. So you so drove, said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You were driving from Rochester to New York. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Yes, wait till oh, you hear this. Cow. So yes, so I got, I would, I had a woman come in and stay at the house with Alexis, my youngest caboose. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I got up at like whatever, one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. She was there. I got in the car with all of the baking goods that Jeannie told me to bring, drove down to the New York Waterway Ferry Terminal, and we started to bake. So, I mean, this is a whole process, too. Oh, my God. I mean, it's been like a so, really Yeah, so now you're baking. So, now, yeah, gonna... so now we're baking, and now, now you need a... So Jeannie and I were baking, and I remember Jeannie, I, like I burned things, I burned the, the, t the, <laughs> the foam that I used, I burned my finger, I go, I couldn't, because we were commercial ovens, you know, we had a great big vat that we were making the mix, you know, mixing the batter in. I wasn't, I was used to like a regular kitchen, like in your house. I had no idea about it. I didn't have any experience with this. So we did it, and she, then she, after I had like gone through all this stuff, burning things, she goes, Sue, maybe you should think about something else. Well, when if people know me, once I've made a decision, that's it. I mean, then I'll figure out how to do this. I will keep doing it until I just not stop until you get it. 
because it was going to be a learning process. So we did. So we kept doing it. And then there were all these seasonal workers on the ship, on the boat, and they would come up and they'd want to help, help by eating and help by helping. And the cookies, it's flour, sugar, egg white, and butter. It's a French twill cookie that, that Jeannie developed. But then we had to figure out how to fold it because these yeah. gigantic, yeah. it's all handmade and hand folded. Anyway, so we figured that whole. So you did cook it. it with the fortune inside? No. So now we needed a template. So we had to go to fabrication plants. So first we went to a wooden. We gave them measurements of what we wanted for the gigantic cookie. That's how we started out. And they made a wooden template. Well, the wood was like, oh my God. So Jean and I went together to the fabrication plants. The wood just, it didn't work. Now Jeannie goes, okay, I know a metal fabricant, fabrication plant in Weehawken, New Jersey. So we go to the metal one and we have a metal template. I mean, this is every time I'm making a trip down, we're doing experimenting. It's not like every day. So, and I had no place to practice at home. So now I, we do the metal. Well, the metal didn't work either. Now Jeannie's father, who was a chemist, said, you have to go to Gru, Susan Gru, their manufacturing plant in Newark, New Jersey, and tell them the dimensions of what you want for this plastic template that okay. you put the batter in and make it, then you lift it up. So Susan and I became very good friends from the Gru manufacturing in Newark, New Jersey. Okay, so now when we're making the cooking, it's a gigantic one. And, it, you know, learning how to fold it and not burning your fingers when it, because it's, it's like um, corning glass when the, as soon as the glass comes out, you have to mold it immediately. Right. Otherwise, yeah. you know, so now we have to do the chocolate. So Jeannie and I go to all, she knows all the places in New York. So now we go to the different chocolate places in the New York area and bring the chocolate back and sip, try it on the cookies. Then we have to decorate it. Oh my God. Then we have to do the message. I mean, so and that's so now we do that. But I just have to tell a funny story. When we were in Weehawken, New Jersey, on the boat, all of a sudden the, the ferry starts to shake. And I go, Oh my God, Jeannie, what is going on in the water here in the Hudson River? That's when the plane landed in the Hudson River. Sully River? Oh, oh, my, no. God. oh my God. I said, Jeannie. Do you feel the boat shaking? I go, what could possibly be going on? We're in like in, in a, like a, not a pond area, but we're in a, a you know, not an area. Did you where see you... it? So we didn't see it, but we felt it. We didn't know at the time what it was, but we find out, it, you know, that it, it's like a mile down the road, down the, on the Hudson River. I mean, it was unbelievable, that true story. I mean, there were so many different experiences. I mean, so many different experiences. But while I was in New York, I said to Jeannie, let's see if I can, you know, sell the cookie. And then we started manufacturing. Went to the, I went back to the fabrication plant. And then I had template, plastic templates that were made to make, you know, the smaller version like they have in the Chinese restaurant. Right. And then a medium, and then a medium sized cookie. So we did that, but in the meantime, while I was there, I said to Jeannie, like, I wonder if I can sell them to somebody here. So um, I remember- So you hadn't sold any yet? No, I'm just learning. This is like going to school. How long, no. how long of a time period was this? Oh, was I working with Jeannie? Oh, because I was only going one day a week? Oh, two and a half years. Oh, two and a half no. years. Every Wednesday, I went down and back, regardless of the weather. My family was so worried. They were so scared. And then I would get tired because I would drive down and drive back that same day. Oh my god. And I would get gosh. home by seven o'clock in the morning to get let my daughter on the school bus. That was important. And then I slept that whole day. Yeah. So yes, I did that for uh, yes, it was about two and a half years. I went every every Wednesday I got up in the middle of the night and we drove down there. Every Wednesday. Yeah. Well, so then you had to sell so, them, right? So now I'm in New York and let me see if I, we can sell, you know, if there is somebody. So we figured out, I mean, like the very first customer I had was the American Museum of uh, Photography in New York City. So they, they purchased the cookies. We had to put in the, the they, they email. So people email me whatever message they would like. We print those and put them in the cookie. 
So that was my very first customer, which is really a fun one because it yeah. was fun. I, I delivered them to there and it would, they showed, you know, we had a tour of the, of the photography museum and they were showing me, oh, they were, oh, they were raffling off some photographs from, from the museum. So that was very, very exciting. And then I did like a toy event for um, women in toys, WIT, W-I-T for women in toys. And they, so we had um, at the pen club, we had a woman, so it was so it was a it was a fundraiser for inner city raising uh, money mm -hmm. to buy toys for inner city children in New York. So what I did is I made um, I had a tray a tray and then on the tray I would have like um, see through like co medium sized cookies, you know, with shred on the bottom. They look beautiful with a fortune message in there related to like the women in toys. Uh -huh. project uh -huh. and then each person would they would purchase these cookies but that money went towards the fundraiser so we did that and then i can't remember now what else what other we did other uh, what other ones we did but so that's what we, that's what i did for like two and a half years but now i needed shipping because now i have a website and people want the cookie and the shipping oh my god i mean i would travel all over to talk to the people about the boxes yeah. how they I said, this, you have to, it has to be packaged. You have to pretend it's an uncooked egg. egg. It's fragile, it's fragile mm -hmm. because it, it, it can crack, because mm -hmm. they can crack easily. So figuring out the packaging was a whole other thing. The shipping, I mean, I'm still in the process of doing all of this. I mean, and then, I mean, I guess one of the things that was like so exciting was like all of a sudden, like one day, now I have the website and everything with the 800 number. All of a sudden, one day I get a phone call and um, they said, this is like MTV and we would like to order cookies for our, you know, as a thank you to all of our clients at MTV. Whoa. And I'm going, and it was a phone call. It wasn't even like an email. And I'm going, I'm thinking, wait, they could, MTV couldn't be calling me on my phone to play, to ask about an order. I said, this had to be a joke they were it was mtv calling so i go oh my god so now i i said would you like me to come down and meet with you and get, have bring samples with you now i put together a whole power this was like this was like a really well there are a lot of fun ones but this was like really you know creative and different so i put together a whole powerpoint with this adorable like fun peppy music you know showing all the different cookies and then I went back and I, I printed out messages that MTV had used in the past and how, and t so then I made a cookie. We were up on the, you know, in the upstairs in the, uh, in the boardroom. I mean, I just had no idea it was gonna be, I remember my sister telling me, Sue, make sure you get to MTV. You get there an hour ahead of time because you're gonna have to go through a whole process where they're gonna to wanna to know who you are and show them all your identification. So you have to get there early. Meanwhile, this was a winter. So I said, oh my God, I can't be late. I've got to drive down the night before and stay in a hotel ah. because I've never been a day early for an interview. <laughs> I was a day early. So I go the part, anyway, so we had the interview. I put together a whole PowerPoint with this music. I gave everybody, I went around the, the boardroom where all the chairs were and I gave, put a fortune cookie where everybody was gonna be sitting. And I said to them, I introduced myself and then I said, you know, if you care to, please feel free to open up the cookie and share your message with everybody here. And they all did that. I mean, I didn't think they would, but they all like opened up their cookie. And that's the whole thing I love about the fortune cookie. It's like a, a it creates a whole camaraderie with everybody. Everybody, yeah. oh, what is your say? What is your say? And that's, I love that kind of interaction. I, I'm not like a researcher working in a lab. I like to be more out there. Mm -hmm. So I, and it's, you know, interesting to hear people's stories because everybody has something that relates to that, whatever that message is. Mm -hmm. So we shared it. And then, oh my God, what's the man's name? We'd like to order them. We'd like to order these thousands of cookies for a corporate sponsorship that they were having, that they wanted the cookies. So then 
Oh my God. So yeah, I did that. And then I, that's when, I, oh, that's, oh, that's the other part of this that I love. So you know how Danny Wegmans hires helping hands, mm -hmm. the people in the, in the orange jacket, because they are either intellectually um, impaired in some way. Mm -hmm. And he wants to give them a, jo a job. I mean, I'm sure he gets a tax credit, but there's still these people have a reason for being that they have a job to get to and it makes them feel good. So I said, you know, why don't I call, you know, to people to help? Why don't I call the um, hearing, you know, RIT? To, to, oh. So I had students who were helping me who were hearing impaired and they have been amazing. So they were helping with the cookies. <sighs> anyway, oh, so. Wow. We're, we're kind of. I guess those are the. What? We're getting to the end of our time. So. Okay. <laughs> this is, this story has. Uh, it's just, I, I'm telling you ladies, it, it's so, if you are not fascinated by this, then um, I, I need to come to your house and check your pulse. <laughs> but it's just, um, Sue, it, it, it goes from your grandmother to the museum, to your divorce, to now you're in this business that, I mean, it's not like you were a little girl saying, gee, I wish I could make fortune cookies. Or, or even, even as, a, as a grown woman saying, you know, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that when I get, when the kids are in, you know, in school or something. No, this just kind of happened and you ran with it. That's what I want people to hear is how you yeah. ran with it and how fate or the universe or whatever we want to say said, this is a good idea. She's really um, passionate. I mean, driving from, from Rochester to New York for heaven's sake. I mean, let's put this out there. I wouldn't do it. I, I would not do it. Um, I've done a lot of things, but I, the, no, I, I draw the line at driving in New York city. No way, Jose, am I going to do that? Um, and, and so I hate to be at, at the end of the show, but you know, this story doesn't have an end. It's still going on. We are in this thing called quarantine. And so your business, like so many other businesses, is kind of at a, at a stalemate or at a, at a, we're not doing a lot of business right now. But, but it seems to me on the May 15th or whenever it is that Governor Cuomo says we're going to all open up. Um, and we're going to do it slowly, I think. You have, I think, perhaps the kind of business where as businesses open up and start to do the kinds of things where they need, they, they need to show their clients and their customers their appreciation. You have something really unique and worthwhile that they could use. That's what I think. Thank you. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of close this here, um, and and I want you to just kind of share any any like last minute thoughts you have on the uh, on where you are now and where you think you can get back to once we get uh, all of our businesses back up and running. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that I think the main thrust or the main the main thrust the main direction that I'd like to move in next is really moving in the direction of what customers would like mm -hmm. and I I do believe that you figure out what you should be doing next not by questioning yourself what you should be doing next by having your customers make a request to to make or do something you've never done before. Mm -hmm. Because it's not only that one customer who's interested in that, there are gonna be 10 others behind her mm -hmm. who are also thinking the same thing. So I think the, the critical thing is to think here what your customers are asking for and not be so set on, this is how I do it, this is how I'm going to do it. You have to like just keep moving forward. And so I, I did that with, with you know, ma manufacturing the, um, the, the mint chocolate for, for a cookie. And I really now, because people are so interested in this gluten-free, and I've like talked to people about the different types of flour we use for a gluten-free cookie, but the auth authenticity comes with the kitchen. It has to be a gluten-free kitchen. That's when it's really, you can use a, 
a gluten free. So I'm exploring that, but at the same time, I was meeting with a, a pastry chef, a pastry owner in the Bronx, where we were exploring making these cookies in large quantities. Mm -hmm. That's when the virus hit. And so we had like one meeting and was scheduled for another meeting. So I hope to continue with that meeting. Well, and the I, other thing is, um, I love the idea of employing people who might be considered disabled because I think they have like a lot to offer. So I love doing that. I really love doing that. But right now, I mean, I just feel I can't. Right, I, right. I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable health wise doing that, you know, until this thing has calmed down, which will be a while, I think. But so those are the things that are like on my mind now. So, so, well, I'm just my mind is just going towards all the different um, groups of people, like nurses and teachers and and um, police departments, and you know, who could use the thank you of this kind of a, a gift that you have a fortune cookie so you know myself and 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 10 other people in my neighborhood want to thank the um the local police department so we purchase a hundred of these cookies from you because it really especially being able then to say thank you in each one and why we're thanking them that's you know that's just something that my mind is saying we're all looking at different ways to reinvent our business now. And I think because you're developing this quantity-based and online-based, it seems like a perfect place for people to um, collectively say, we want to thank this whole group of other people, or we want to support this whole group of other people and you have something really unique and tasty. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not leaving out the tasty part because it's really attractive to me, especially when you say chocolate. So, so we have to go now because this is the end of our time for today, but um, maybe after everything gets back up, we can revisit and see how things are going and have another conversation all about this. I would enjoy that. All right, thank you so much, Sue. Ladies, Ladies of America, I will be back next week. This is Yvonne DeVita from Smart Women Conversations.